Hey everyone, welcome to this Jekyll video series. In this and the next two videos, I'm going to be diving into the great tool that Jekyll is. In this one, it's going to be talking about what Jekyll is, why you should care, and then how to get the installation going. In the second one, we'll be diving into the structure of the website and how to configure it. And then in the final video, we'll be talking about deploying to GitHub and configuring your Jekyll website to have a custom URL. So the first question is, of course, what is Jekyll? Why should you care? So Jekyll is a Ruby-based scaffolding tool that's used to quickly deploy static and blog-aware websites. And we'll come back and break down what all that means in a minute. But why should you care? So say you want to build a website like a personal blog or a portfolio or a site for your business, but you don't want to deal with another platform like WordPress or Blogger. Now, platforms like that are pretty, pretty easy to set up and get going, but there's a lot of configuration that you have to do. You have to pay for a host unless you want some advertisement on your website, which no one wants that. And there's plugins that you have to deal with. It's, it tends to be just a more expensive, both dollar-wise and time and brain power commitment-wise, then you need a lot of the time, especially if you're just doing something like a blog or, or a website that could be static really easily. In cases like that, Jekyll is our hero. There's no database to deal with, so it's lightweight, easy to use, it hosts for free on GitHub pages, which saves you a ton of money on hosting. And right out of the box, it gives you a deployable website that is yours to customize or push as is. Although if you pushed it as is, that wouldn't really make sense because then you just have a canned website. Let me go back to what I was saying before about Jekyll being a Ruby-based scaffolding tool for quickly deploying static blogware websites, as you can see so informatively on Jekyll RB's homepage. Jekyll itself is a Ruby gem that you'll have to install and we'll get to that in a minute. And when I say it's a scaffolding tool, I mean when you run the Jekyll program, it scaffolds, quote unquote, or produces the files that make up the majority of the website that you'll later on be deploying. And as I also said, it's yours to customize. You just won't have to be doing what we call boilerplate code, which is hooking up the CSS and hooking up the JavaScript and the jQuery. And as you'll see later on, there's a lot of templating also that gets done for you automatically. Blog Aware is one of the really nice features about Jekyll. To use your site as a blog, all you have to do is make a page with a certain naming convention and put it in a certain place. And Jekyll automatically recognizes it as a blog post and puts it on your site automatically. It's a really great feature. So let's jump right into the installation. To get Jekyll going in the first place, you have to have Ruby installed on your machine. If you have a Mac, you already have Ruby. If you're on a Windows machine, you may or may not have it depends on if you've worked with Ruby in the past. From that point, we're going to be going through these directions in your terminal or your command prompt, depending on which operating system you're using. Now, if you type in gem install Jekyll, like we will do here, if you're on a Windows machine, this will install it for you. If you're on a Mac, you will get an error and it'll say you don't have right permissions for this library. Basically, long story short, Apple is the patriarchy and doesn't want you to have fun with your computer, so it's keeping you out. The way to get around this and install Jekyll anyways is with the sudo command. So it'll be sudo gem install Jekyll, and it'll ask you for your password. Enter your password and it'll go. If you don't have a password on your account, you can't just enter nothing. You have to go to your user account, add a password, come back, type your password, and enter it. I know, 
Apple is the patriarchy. I already have Jekyll installed on my machine, but when you went through it, hopefully it gave you a message saying that it was successfully installed. If you would like to confirm that, or if at some point in the future you want to confirm that your installation of Jekyll is working properly, you can type in Jekyll-V. And basically that query will ask your computer what version of Jekyll is running. In this case, I have Jekyll 2.5.3. If my installation was corrupted, or if it just wasn't there, an error message would be thrown instead of the name of the program with the version number. The last thing we're going to do is look at Jekyll Serve. And Jekyll has a really nice feature where if you run Jekyll Serve within a project folder, it will start a virtual server and you can actually look at what the website looks like in your browser. So we'll change directory over to desktop and then we'll type in Jekyll serve dash w dash dash base URL empty quotes. At this point the w flag and the base URL flag are probably not necessary but it's a good habit to get into for later on when you're making changes and in particular especially when you're changing the base URL. So dash w tells Jekyll to watch and as you're making changes to files and saving them Jekyll will detect that and reload that page to reflect the changes that you made. Base URL, that flag says make, an em make it empty. And that's what those two, two quotes are there for. So all that's left to do is go to localhost port 4000 and see what Jekyll hath wrought for us. And there it is, this is your website. It's got a header, it's got a footer, it's got a content area, it's got everything you could possibly want on a website. And then in the next video, we'll look at how it all breaks down and we'll start getting into the customization and configuration. See you next time.